I'm a researcher at uh, ISTI, Consiglio Nazionale della Ricerca, so computer scientist. But I'm also, I also happen to be the technical manager of the open air uh, scholarly communication infrastructure. So today I was asked actually to introduce the infrastructure to tell you what it is. So the, uh, the outline of the talk will go basically through the history, the original history of the infrastructure, so why uh, we were called up to the army, basically. And then to introduce you to the overall organization, so through the human uh, part of this infrastructure and the technological part, which uh, uh, supports it. And then in the end, I'll give you a few hints on the future steps. So first of all, everything started in 2009 with a pilot from the EC. So the EC started experimenting with us scientists, uh, recommending, strongly recommending in the, um, in the project proposals, actually in the contracts, to publish open access. That was called the Special Clause 39. And it involved only the 20% of the program areas. What they were asking for is the, for the publications and the results of scientific projects to be deposited in uh, uh, repositories, pos possibly open access repositories, that they should be uh, at least in embargo, uh, but open access for uh, at, at most, uh, at most uh, for 12, 12 months in embargo, but in open access, possibly in open access. And they were strongly recommended it, so it wasn't mandatory at all, but it was an initial experiment. And they would also provide uh, gold payments for your open access license. I'm not sure you're all familiar with what gold open access is, but basically you pay, uh, the author pays um, to get uh, the paper, remove the copyrights, and be... Um, open access out there. So the pilot also wanted uh, whoever would win the call to disseminate the notion of open access, make sure researchers are fully aware of what it is and how they can benefit from it, and uh, so forth. So open air came um, as the winner of this call. And from 2009 and 2012, uh, we started collecting uh, basically uh, metadata about publications that was funded um, by uh, EC projects. And we started providing statistics about the ratio between open access and non-open access for such projects at the level of country and, and so on. And we became, slowly became, a point of reference for open access in Europe. Again, this is an effort that is uh, also uh, highly based on the human contribution, uh, not only a technical effort. Uh, once the project was over, uh, it had a continuation called Open Air Plus. Still, it would run the so-called open air infrastructure, so the, the, the brand of the infrastructure didn't change. And we extended uh, our scope to uh, any open access article. Uh, before, we were only interested in those that were connected to a project, because we were really serving the EC from that perspective. And we extended our um, boundaries beyond EC projects, so we also include national funding schemes as a way to experiment what we uh, had in mind. And of course we uh, moved towards resource data. So we, we were not focusing only on uh, publications as the traditional outcome of our resource life cycles, but also on data sets. And trying to put all this outcome in context, so in relationships uh, with pro projects, funding schemes and people and several other aspects. So the open air infrastructure basically consists of these two main layers. On the one hand, you, we have a human network which uh, covers the whole of Europe and any infrastructure that sustains it and provides the services um, to achieve what I just mentioned. Uh, we, in general, adopt what we call a, a participatory approach. So our intention is not to reinvent the wheel whenever possible, but to capitalize on previous investment, not only of the EC, not necessarily of the EC, um, we do this with repositories by involving the community of the repositories uh, with the technologies. So we try to reuse, of course, everything we produce in terms of technologies, open source, but is also based on existing products. And on whatever organization and people uh, would come up with that is interesting and relevant to our mission. So in terms of humans, <laughs> the human uh, network, we uh, actually have one representative for each of the uh, EC country. And these representatives that are called NOADs, National Open Access Desks, are in charge of involving the research libraries. So uh, reaching the research libraries and discussing what open access is at uh, this uh, level. 
And then, of course, they also have another important uh, value, which is the bottom-up approach. Basically, they try to capture what's going on at the national level in terms of open access initiatives and bring it up uh, to um, the head, so to the coordination of the nodes, where it can eventually be distributed uh, uh, bottom again to those countries who didn't know or didn't know about certain things or events. And so the, to facilitate the reuse uh, of the uh, advocacies and uh, policies uh, mechanisms at the level of the nations. Of course, it's all, it's all about open air advocacy, uh, but also about our harmonization. So another important thing that the NOAAs have done uh, by have, um, binding with um, the repository community is that of defining guidelines. So the definition of guidelines um, uh, is actually uh, key and vital you know, to, to uh, grow up uh, a community which is robust enough and sustainable in the future. So we, uh, we worked with uh, repository managers and librarians, uh, mostly uh, with um, an inheritance that we had from the driver projects, driver, driver two projects on what uh, we call the guidelines for literature repositories. This is one example. So this is um, a very short document where repository managers can describe how they're supposed to export their data, their metadata about publications in order to comply to the uh, open air infrastructure guidance. Meaning, for example, that uh, they're supposed to provide um, bibliographical metadata um, completed with project information where, uh, where it exists. Uh, with um, copyright information um, based on a given vocabularies that we have and so forth. If you want to know more, I'll be happy to explain. Uh, we also have guidelines for data repositories. So we engaged with uh, several organizations work in, working in this field, main uh, uh, data repositories themselves, including DANS, uh, STVC, for example. And we defined uh, what we believe are the simplest way, what, what we believe is the simplest way uh, for data repositories to export their data. So we basically uh, um, ended up at the level of data citation, uh, adopting data site as uh, the main mechanism, profiling with special things that we need in open air, again, references to projects or references to publications and so on to reuse uh, the data in context where it exists. And finally, uh, we work closely with uh, Serif, so the Serif community, it's actually part of the consortium, to define guidelines for CRIS managers. So how to export data in a CRIS system in a way that is uh, uh, compatible with OpenAir. We actually also took the opportunity to simplify their uh, previous uh, instructions, we were, which were kind of complicated to be implemented by the vendors and um, CRIS managers in general. Again, you have a link there, which is guidelines.openair.eu, of course. It goes back. And um, these guidelines are open also to comment, to feedback, to input. So we are always trying to engage those that, in the end, will have troubles caused by <laughs> our choices. Um, so here, I'm, I will start describing what we do in, te in technological terms but at a very high level. So. Uh, if you want to know more, we can do it offline. But basically, what OpenAI offers, te technically speaking, is, uh, is a help desk. And the help desk is basically the technical tools that mediates between the nodes. So and every, um, the, 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 let's say, the knowledge keeper about open access and uh, the um, researchers or the organizations and institutions that are interested to know better. Um, the second thing, of course, is a portal. It's a 24-7 service where uh, users at different level of abstractions can actually access the whole graph of information that we're building because uh, in, in OpenR Plus, we moved on to data in context again. So you'll be able to browse through persons to publications, to data sets, to projects, to uh, uh, research areas and draw your conclusions. And finally, uh, we also provide Zenodo. Zenodo is a, is a repository for those authors who are orphan uh, of a repository of reference for publications or for data sets. Um, when it's data sets, it's more about the long tail data, uh, data sets, so secondary data of a, of a limited size, let's say. But Zenodo proved to be very useful and we have a lot of users. I'll tell you more about it later on. 
So this is what we will find there, basically services for researchers who can deposit uh, their publications and data via Zenodo, but it can also give us extra information about how their existing publications, maybe in a journal, are linked to projects. Uh, and of course, they can find open access information and author guides. Data providers, we are actually helping them to understand how they can export their data towards our system. Um, and how, how can I actually harmonize their data according to the community guidelines that have been defined by the community. And uh, resource managers, this is a, again a different level. So we are talking about project coordinators, for example, who are willing to know and to show off actually how they've been doing uh, in the years uh, in, in, in the projects they've been coordinating. We offer a number of services here to serve their needs, including uh, Fancy, fancy widgets you can put in your project website to show the list of publications, for example. Um, and finally, funding agencies. This is another important uh, goal. The EC, thanks to our tools, can actually measure the impact of the different investments they've made, right? So the level of a country, the level of uh, a funding area or a sub-program or in to, to the finer grain of projects. So here is an overall picture of the technical infrastructure. You have at the, top, at the top, you have the functionalities that are provided by the portal. And at the bottom, you have the typologies of data sources we are dealing with, which can be summarized in four main categories. It's repository uh, for publications, repository for data, CRIS systems, which we believe are three main players and we actually have defined guidelines for them. And then what we call, as a very general term, entity registries. Entity registries are those data sources available on the internet uh, the, whose organization, uh, I mean the organization around them, uh, takes care of uh, authority lists or uh, entity definition, uh, identity, um, maintenance, and so on. And these are very useful and these are activities that we actually don't want to carry on in, a, in our project. Examples are uh, Open Door from the UK, for example, which keeps a very nice list and curated list of uh, European repository for publications. Re3 Data is uh, uh, very keen to this, but focused on um, data repositories. So we are trying to take advantage actually to liaise uh, with all these kind of infrastructures. For those, of course, we don't have any uh, guidelines. We might have in the future, if the repository sync from Herbert <laughs> will take over, and that's, uh, that would be uh, very important, but we establish one-to-one um, -one connections. So what we do in the middle um, is basically we collect the information, so information about publications, organizations, data sources themselves, uh, persons, data sets, and we build a graph, a graph of objects. And this graph interconnects these entities one to the other where the relationships are available. But we do something else on top. So we do a lot of text mine and text mine helps us to uh, deduplicate. And this is often the case when you collect metadata from several data sources. Uh, helps us to identify relationships of the classical kind like citations, similarity, which is not listed here, classification and so on. Uh, and then we take this graph and we offer it to the users and also via APIs to applications. We, we are serving today uh, several applications who are downloading objects from uh, our graph. Of course, we are driven by guidelines for interoperability and we have also guidelines for use services, okay? So we have certain limitations uh, that we like to apply to those who are willing to consume our data. They have to do it in a certain way. They can access the whole thing, but following certain paradigms. So a nice thing we can do, and it's the immediate benefit for, uh, from the construction of this graph, is the production of uh, project statistics in general. So this is uh, an example of project productivity over time, uh, uh, post-project and uh, monitoring. This is, again, another useful thing, which you cannot do with a, a traditional tools from the EC, which stop collecting information about the project outcome when the project ends. Publication locations, so where these are located, where they, they are located in terms not only of data sources as indicated here, but uh, uh, in terms of countries, for example. And open access mandate conformance, this is another important aspect. 
The open air data flow, just to get a little bit deeper into the technology, um, is the following. So we collect from data sources, we collect from end users, we call them claims. So we, this is when the authors uh, come to us and tell us, hey, this is my publication with the DOI and you can link it to this project and this is open access or not open access. Or what they can do is to give their ORCID identifier and download their publications and link them. They can also search for publications on our information space, identify theirs and link them to projects. And this happens when project coordination are actually demand, project coordinators are demanding the researchers to do it in order to increase the number of publications uh, visible and associated to the project in the portal. Thanks to this, we build a native information space, which is again dirty, so it's uh, non-harmonized metadata, possibly duplicated. So we did duplicate it and we build what we call the public information space, which can be uh, directly accessed through the portal and through APIs. But on top of this, we do also extra data inference and user data curation. We create an enriched information space, which is feedback to the duplication. And this is an ongoing process that goes on forever. So uh, we tend to materialize a new index, a new refresh every week. That's the uh, rhythm that we are trying to keep up with. So these are the, the, these are the examples of the data sources uh, from which we are importing. For example, data centers and thematic like DataCite, uh, like Dryad. We have uh, from publication repositories, institutional, but also journals. So we include journals in the picture and thematic repositories like Archive, for example. Uh, aggregators of both repositories and, and data sets, entity registries and CRIS systems. The, um, Experimentation with CRIS systems is not yet started. The rest is already in production. Uh, we import from end users, so we import from Zenodo, of course. So if you're depositing into Zenodo, of course, indirectly, you, you, will, you are depositing into OpenAir. Um, we uh, do cross-ref claiming, as I just suggest before, so suggested before, so you can provide us with a UI and relative publications, and we do uh, the connection and the harmonization. And we also offer data curation tools. These are to be uh, released by the end of the year. But basically, data curators or end users can come and fix, not really directly fix, but advise on how to improve uh, the information space and the result of inference algorithms, which are not necessarily 100% uh, correct. So it, it curators can actually um, go over the input given by the users and uh, possibly publish it with many thanks to the users. And we also import from inference. Again, inference is applied on PDFs. Uh, we uh, download PDFs where possible by establishing often face-to-face um, uh, -face agreements with uh, repository managers. We are not distributing PDFs, so we are not actually, actually acting as a mediator of the PDFs. We always give visibility to the original repository, so the, the, the final clicks go there with this, this is the philosophy. But thanks to their contribution, we can infer several things. These are just examples, links to projects again, or connections, DOI connections uh, to data sets often, um, publication to publication, and uh, we can also improve the quality of metadata, which sometimes uh, is not really at the league of what you would expect from a repository, a curated repository. Again, Zenodo uh, is, um, we call it a catch-all repository. It's an open-air CERN joint effort. It's based on their own technology, which is called uh, Invenue. It's open source again, and uh, it includes uh, a nice suite of services. So you can also build, uh, if you want, a community for your group of people or for your project in order to use the repository as the place where you would uh, store uh, all the results of your project, be them data sets and, uh, or publication. It's curated, so every single record is looped uh, after and um, curated and curated before being published. You are released the DOI, so whatever you put in there um, has its own uh, DOI. And then it provides, it provides uh, nice uh, features to link to other publications and data and so on. So finally, just four slides to tell you where we are and where we're going. So these are some numbers. So we have uh, 8 million publications, open access and non-open access uh, linked to projects, not necessarily all of them, because we uh, actually um, 
loosened uh, our constraints so we can have open access publication because we are interested in those even if they don't have a link to uh, a project while we are very strict on non-open access so we are only interested in those if they have a link to a project because we need them to calculate the ratio. Um, in, uh, originally just to give you an idea of the figures we have 12 public million publications right so after the duplication almost 10% uh, goes away um, even more actually no actually we have nine ten ten millions so almost a ten percent the same for authors we are collecting now from 460 data providers uh, of different typologies the majority of them of course is repositories uh, for publications and um, we collect from two funders, so the Wellcome Trust and AC, but others will follow. And we found links to uh, 600 data sets uh, from the PDFs. That's not an easy thing uh, because of two main reasons. First of all, it's, it's not easy to uh, reach the PDF, the original PDF. So you always need an agreement in the end, even when it's open access, because you cannot bomb a website, try to download all their files. They're blacklist you for sure after your first attempt so you need always to interact with them and that's what we are doing actually uh, is ongoing while i'm speaking uh, with hal for example you know the big repositories like archive we download the whole set uh, and the second reason is uh, because as many uh, previous speakers have uh, highlighted it's uh, not still common it's not in the cultural uh, it's not in the culture of researchers to uh, cite directly their data sets. So there are disciplines where this is quite common, but the majority of them uh, really is unaware, I would say, of the value of this practice. Um, here is what's going on beyond Europe. So uh, the NOAAs are based on CORE, which is the Confederation of Open Access Repositories it's worldwide. And thanks to CORE, uh, we are trying to offer our approach both in technology, in technological uh, opportunities and in methodological opportunities to other continents. So uh, I can tell you about South America. We, are work we worked closely with Argentina. So they are currently using our technology and they're moving up to La Referencia, which is basically the same idea of uh, aggregation of repositories but at the level of South America. And we are in strict relationships and we'll work with them in the future. We have contacts we share. And, and it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very interesting approach, the one they're adopting based on uh, subscriptions and notifications. But anyway, the idea is still the same. Collecting information about open access uh, publications and distribute it as much as possible to those that are interested to access it. And the same experiences are ongoing uh, in the other continents. From Canada, it's still a question mark. Um, so what's going to happen? We're moving now from the FP7 open access pilot that I mentioned in the beginning of this talk to uh, H2020. So Horizon 2020 is going to be a nightmare for most of the, yes, um, indeed a nightmare for most of the uh, researchers because first of all, I don't know about you, but I'm a researcher also, and the majority of researchers do not know anything about these things. I mean, they don't care. They keep on publishing according to their old traditional schemes you know, following the most fancy journals. But now these things have to change. This is a mandate, so it's, it's not a recommendation anymore. And institutions have to inform their researchers they must publish open access at some point. This actually uh, will require a shift, right, and a cultural shift towards a previous system to a new system. Uh, they envisage that in five years everything will be open access. This may be true, maybe not, but for sure, if you don't give me the money, you know, the carrot, but that's more of the stick. So um, this is what they're expecting from us. So 100% of program areas are involved. You must publish open access with some, exception, with some exceptions uh, uh, for certain disciplines. And at, on top of that, we have the open data pilot. I'm not sure you're all aware of what it is, but it goes in the direction of a publication, so you're somehow obliged to uh, make your data public if you produce some data in, uh, in, your, uh, in your project. Uh, with several degrees of liberty, let's say, of freedom of choosing how to do it, because it's still in a very vague uh, 
uh, limbo, but uh, in the years to come, this will become stronger and stronger recommendations. So this is just to give the time to nations and organizations to structure up in order to be able to uh, serve these needs, because that's not an easy task, right? So in Italy, this is what's going on. We're trying to understand how can we cope, how can we help organizations to comply to it? It's not, it's not easy. So in open, open air, uh, we'll try uh, to be alive in uh, uh, Horizon 2020, and uh, we, we will extend the scope to a richer number of research products. There's no boundary now. We, the, the publication is just one of the many. We'll try to do our best to integrate them with each other, include several including several communities, but most of all, uh, liaise with the community themselves in order to explain them how to uh, expose the, their products in a, in a sensible, shareable uh, way. And finally, services. Again, we will extend uh, the, broad of, uh, the, the scope of the services to altmetrics, to other kinds uh, of um, numbers with which we can play in order to evaluate the quality of the resources we produce. And this is, again, another important step down the road. Thank you. I'm done. So.